So the room is actually full, so you should. You, you can. It's okay. okay. <laughs> I'd like to know who's using IoT at home. Obviously, you guys are all working with it, except for like five percent of the room. So every IoT conference I go to, I ask people this. Yeah, sure. Is this it? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, so I go to these IoT conferences all the time, and I always ask this question. And uh, the number's getting higher and higher, but from the hands that went up then, it was about 5%. So I guess everyone's... Who's worked with an Arduino? Okay. Who's worked with a Raspberry Pi? Who's worked with sort of custom controllers or more low-level stuff? Okay, that's interesting. So I think that's still only going to like 10, 15% there. Hey, I, if, if you, instead of the question, how many have a connected device that does something in the home and has a service? Okay. Yeah, okay, going that broad, who has a connected device in their home? No yeah. Okay, that's looking about 40% now. And who's... Yeah, like network routers. Yeah, any, anything like that, I guess. Yeah, so that's everyone. That's 100%. Um, otherwise, I don't know why you're here. Um, Who's uh, built on top of these APIs? So there's all these connected devices which are siloed. Is anyone actually doing anything with the API? Okay, that's about 20%, probably less than that actually. And why is that? Is it just uh, you don't have enough time or you're just not that interested in doing it? This guy said you need to learn some JavaScript to, well, to access the API. Yeah. Yeah, so they say it's a REST API, you can do everything, well, but it fun, doesn't. I have to do something with Raspberry Pi, we changed three operating systems, and for a very basic thing, which is, I mean, streaming video, we had to check four different approaches, and eventually it worked out, but we spent so much time that if you had to build a client yeah. all the yeah. hours, definitely not count with them. Okay, so an API isn't good enough, so how do you think we should solve this? Yeah. Okay, so there's a these, these cloud APIs, everything is being siloed, so that's a problem. And we don't want to work directly with APIs, so do you want client libraries and your own languages? Is that one solution you think? Yeah. yeah? One of the problems I had with Arduino to get with really cheap hardware and QDT stable working. Yeah. And yeah. used and QDT with almost everything to open doors, uh, to yeah. uh, use RFID, to use messaging. Um, actually, we had to swap out the um, Arduinos for Raspberry Pis, which mm -hmm. are more expensive, yeah. to get things working. So we want more low-cost devices that can run better protocols. Yeah. We, we don't want to use HTTP. I don't want to use HTTP for these things. I would ideally like to be able to buy a $15 device that can start doors. Yeah. 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 Okay. I'm solving a lot of uh, problems with protocols by using an integration platform. Mm -hmm. uh, there's one called Open Hub. Okay. And yeah. It supports like 70 protocols and technologies. Who's used Open Hub here? How long did it take you to get it set up from scratch? I saw it and I was like, I don't have time for this. This is crazy. It's easy if you yeah. don't want to build from source. Yeah. yeah. But if you want to build from source, yeah, it takes some time to get a flow to okay. set it up. Would you suggest everyone try it out? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that's awesome. May I add to that? Yeah, I'll go over Everybody here. Everybody gets one open hub to talk to another open hub. <laughs> okay, one guy. <laughs> that's 0.1% of the room, maybe. If I may add one to that. Uh, yeah. One problem I see with the APIs and with all the protocols, they're all open to do everything. Yeah. And nobody tells you what to do. Yeah, they're not standardized. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The application layer is the problem in my head. Okay. I don't think I'm old enough to have used X10. It's quite old. Who, who's used X10? Anyone used X10? I know it, but I haven't used it. No. I, I can agree on that. Yeah. I think Z-Wave is more interesting. Yeah. Who, who's used Zigbee and Z-Wave? Who's used both and which one do you prefer? Yeah. I think Z-Wave, even though it's not open source, Yeah. If I go on like Amazon or anything like that and I look for Z-Wave X device or whatever I want and I do the same with Zigbee, I always find a lot of Z-Wave stuff. So I'm, I'm really leaning towards that. I think in the US they're leaning more towards Zigbee. I don't know what your opinion is, but um, 
Yeah. But going in that direction, I mean, in Europe, every fourth year, we have a new technology. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I was in the 90s on the conference where we had the final solution. It's called Lonework. How many knows about Lonework? It had everything. It had an OSI stack, any physical layer, radio, whatever mm -hmm. you wanted. It had unique IDs on every device. It had properties say, I am a wall switch and I am a lamp mm -hmm. and I can talk to each other. And mm. it had interoperable data. But I'm sorry, for, for creating an agent, everything is connected with the uh, long walk and we have 500,000 nodes each way. Yes. Can we repeat this but for the video? I don't know the protocol you just mentioned. Uh, exactly, yeah. But there's very long big, works. There's very big installations with long <coughs> works running today. Millions of devices. Yeah. And you don't even know the protocol. Hmm. And is it an industrial solution? Is that what has been useful? What's the main use case? Doing automation. So just general automation. There's no okay. automation in an interoperable way. Yeah. But so it's old. And it has a 48-bit authentication. Okay. Which you could crack in two seconds. Yeah. And so nobody uses it anymore. Yeah. And now the physical thing is the one we do. So we change the physical layer. Mm. And hopefully everything goes to Wi-Fi. No, we do need other things. Yeah. Yeah. And so we constantly need to bridge between different things, either locally or higher up. I can explain a project. Let me, let me take this. This is actually, um, who, knows, who knows CERN, the accelerators and the, the large hadron colliders? And it's, it's kind of like an internet of things because they have these really huge, it's 22 kilometer circumference um, collider system. And they're controlling all of these different machines in real time. So this is, there's, the thing has two halves. There's the controlling the experiment and spinning up these particles which go faster and faster and faster. And they use, they use magnets and accelerators and lasers and whatever else magic, I don't know. And then there's actually the experiments themselves, which are these big machines where they smash particles and they photograph the results while they, they capture that and they send up data. So it's the first part I'm, that I've, I've, I've seen. And the problem they have there is that every single manufacturer has their own protocols. So they have, they have five or 10,000 devices and they have 100 different suppliers. And they're all providing these things with funny industrial control serial ports and RS-323 and some random USB and it's all different and all bizarre. And so their solution is to basically write for every device a kind of a driver layer which will talk to that device and is custom coded, too bad, and then map that onto some standard open protocol that they can then build infrastructure and middleware on top of. And then they can do command and control protocols which talk to this fabric and then talk to the devices. So it means that they can actually bully their suppliers into writing these drivers. And the, the drivers can be closed source. It doesn't matter as long as they're talking the open protocol. Does this come back against the APIs and libraries? We don't want to use right. raw APIs. Right. We want nice libraries that are well right. written and in our own languages. Well, it comes, yes, it comes to giving developers, mm -hmm. I think, very simple APIs at the right level, which, which are simple and which work in C, work in Python, work in PHP, work in Java and which talk protocols which work in any language. Mm -hmm. So you don't want a protocol or an API which is language specific, otherwise you start making fragmentation. And you don't want closed protocols, otherwise you can never actually do a kind of a hostile, you know, a hostile stack, like, you know, the supplier is not collaborating, so you can fix his stuff. If the protocol is open, so I'm sorry, I think the room is full and it's actually marked as full outside, so we can't come in. And that seems to work, but that's, that's, that's a very slow project. It still takes them years and years to build up this infrastructure. But that was their, that was their goal. And they, actually, they were actually using CORBA as their messaging system, and they're moving to a 0MQ-based um, system, which is open, but that's not really the thing. But it seems to be simplicity and language accessibility. If you get simple APIs that you can use quickly and which work out of the box, that seems to be, mm. you know, <coughs> none of us have time to, to spend, right? Yes, 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 there are. At CERN, but it's yes, at CERN. Based. Um, Is there any other? I could recommend a speech for free that I'm holding. <laughs> so, for example, this morning we saw we saw an example ZOCP, which was, and this is the funny thing about uh, I'm not going to advertise ZeroMQ, but what ZeroMQ actually gives us is a kind of a, a toolkit for building custom protocols very quickly. 
testing them and developing them quite sophisticated protocols and doing it very very quickly in a in a language neutral way so we can experiment it used to take six months to make even a minimal protocol and maybe several years to make a real protocol and now we can do this in a few days a few hours practically so that's interesting in terms of developing simpler solutions to connectivity and there's also a solution that's working today with tens of billions of things right. federating each other it's called xmpp yes it's an asymmetric link and you can use it for devices how efficient is it compared to let's say mtpt or some other well it is xml yeah. it's xml yes so it's not a binary mm -hmm. uh, there's an u2c standardization of how to binary compile or, or transport oh sorry, sorry. Uh, the XMPP transport is an XML based, therefore we can extend it at any time with namespaces and so on. Uh, WTC has an extension called uh, EXI, where you can binary transport any XML. Uh, you just remove all tags. It's if you have seven tags, it's three bits. So if you have a hash table with all the up repeated strings, it's quite thick. And then you, if you comp compress the strings and so on. And that's standardized, so you can do it on any XML at any level. But of course, no, it's not for a temperature sensor. But for an open hub or a device that's your gateway, throwing up to the whole federated network of uh, XMPP servers, anything could talk to anything in uh, any other domain. Mm -hmm. And you can use any physical layers you want in your home, going to a co-op or whatever, and then federating it, making businesses between companies, whatever. Any device in any company can talk to any device in another company, just as you would do instant messaging. Three o'clock. <laughs> uh, you're advertising your talk? Yes. Ah, that's what it was. I have some crazy methodology I'm working on. I'm working on something called the IoT methodology. Um, does anyone have a laptop I can use a VJ connection with, which is connected to the internet? I have a Mac, but I don't have my adapter to connect it with. And do you have an internet connection there? Uh, I'm joined to the network, so okay. you should be able. Perfect. Okay, so my, my name is Tom Collins. I'm working for a startup called SmartLiving.io, and we're a Belgian-based startup building uh, an Internet of Things end-to-end -end solution. And basically, we've been working on this for you're connected, so a you year. We've been working on it for about a year or two, and um, I've been involved in a ton of different aspects of the platform. And what I'm trying to do now is to share some of the things that I've learned from it uh, and make it a bit easier for other people to build IoT projects. Can you say that again, sorry? Are you the guys for uh, no, no, we're not. The ecosystem will be speaking later today. That's Pat, and they actually have a stand in the building AW. Okay, so yeah. I heard the Yeah, so they're talking at twelve o'clock. Okay, I'm working on this crazy IoT methodology. I'll, I'll dig into that a bit deeper. Some context for this. Um, so Smart Living is a platform we're building. So if you go to smartliving.io, we've uh, currently launched a platform in beta. And you can connect things like Arduino, smartphones, there's uh, HTML5 widgets, there's all sorts of different things you can connect. Uh, the back end for it, we're using RabbitMQ, so you can connect with MQTT, AMQP, Stomp, there's REST interfaces, so you can connect pretty much what you want. We're really pushing Z-Wave as well. So we have a Z-Wave gateway we're working on. We have a Raspberry Pi sort of developer version so you can extend the gateway. And then we have this really slim, lightweight uh, Z-Wave to IP version six. So it does everything in the cloud and you just have to plug this thing into your router and you can start connecting to Z-Wave devices. So that's smart living. I'm not gonna go into that. It's, uh, if, you wanna, if you're interested, you can look at that. The IoT methodology is really something I'm pushing at the moment. So it's uh, trying to collect best practices for approaching IoT. Uh, and abstract between uh, designers and developers. The biggest problem I have with our development team is uh, we get lots of crazy ideas, but then they start thinking about limitations of protocols and technologies and how can we convert these ideas into working projects and actually prototype them and start seeing results straight away. Um, I was recently at Intel in Munich as well, trying out <coughs> their Edison and Galileo, which are really awesome prototyping boards. 
if you've used Arduino and Raspberry Pi, you're going to hit roadblocks eventually. because They're not really designed for IoT. They're just microcontrollers, which people are trying to use for IoT now. The Galileo, it's kind of for IoT. The Edison is really positioned for it. If you don't know what it is, it's a tiny little controller about this big running a, a Linux operating system. It has Wi-Fi, Bluetooth. Uh, it's really, really nice. So the goal of this IoT methodology is to allow everyone to experience the Internet of Things by seeing and feeling potentials of common use cases through iterative prototyping and a lean startup mentality. Everything I see at the moment is people talking about these huge numbers, we're going to connect everything in the world, we're all going to become fat and lazy and it's going to save the planet. It's all talk at the moment. I don't really see that much action. For the last two years, I haven't really seen too much. I go to a lot of these conferences and there's still people talking. I like to see live demos. And it's, it's quite hard to, to find them. Um, by the common use cases, what I mean by that is we do a lot of co-creation sessions, and people always come up with the same use cases. They want a smart fridge, they want a smart car, they want a smart this, they want a smart that. And until these people see it and actually try it out, they're not going to think, what we're going to do next? What are we are going to build on top of it? So it's concerning the services and apps that we actually build on top of these common use cases. So this leads into the meaningful Internet of Things for humans. Cisco, IBM, they're all pushing smart cities. I don't know if you see many use cases for these smart cities. I don't know if you walk down the street and you think, how am I going to connect this lamp to this bus and to this car and build this awesome application? This is really what they're trying to push, but I don't feel that inspired that I want to build an application based on these smart city APIs. So the overall goal is to enable individuals, communities, and organizations to think, imagine, and question what's next and in inspire the next killer app. That's, that's really what I want to push and, and get people to, to start building things. Um, this, this, is the, this is the fluffy ethos of the whole project. Um, it needs to be in the spirit of the World Wide Web and open source. It shouldn't be governed by po profit or politics. And it should just be about creativity, enthusiasm, uh, and pushing people to do something new. Uh, so the, the IoT methodology aims to provide a loosely structured ecosystem of mutual value for all that participate by sharing, collaboration, community, and learning. So I don't, we don't want enterprises and people governing what's going on. Enterprises should be involved to provide that aspect, which is really a top down, but it should be from the maker community, building things, testing things, uh, and really trying these things out. So it's uh, an ecosystem of tools, design patterns, architecture reference models, and guidelines for building IoT solutions. When we built Smart Living, there's no real references. We could find these uh, silo solutions, but um, it's very hard to find actual use cases that people are using. Yes? Yes, uh, considering the fact that you invest a lot of time in going to conferences, doing research in the area, what's the most exciting application of IoT? I mean, in a very general sense, yeah. not only technology, but exciting for the uh, saving of planet thing uh, that you've seen so far implemented and not only designed. OK, so that's the, the most interesting uh, IoT solution yeah, in general, yeah? yeah. Um, I think Node-RED is really awesome, and um, I saw that two years ago, a big demo of it, and it was in a, a conference room, and I can't remember the guy's name, um, but he had everyone in the room using Twitter to interact with this IoT platform, and there's little LEDs lighting up on this uh, device he had. So that was a real IoT use case with everyone interacting with it, and that was, that was really awesome. Uh, the benefit it was that you could just prototype really easily and start hooking up these devices and building automation over them. So even if you have a distributed platform, it doesn't matter if it's connected to a Z-Wave gateway, if it's a maker's device, if it's some consumer solution, you could uh, start hooking these things so together. Demo, what I was thinking about, like you mentioned the bus going... Uh, yeah, yeah. Following the, the lights following the bus on the street, this would be a real, real life example. So I'm wondering, what's yeah. the, the most exciting real life application of IoT? So it was a frost yeah. detection, yeah. temperature detection, uh, yeah. general environmental sensors, I guess, yeah. Um, it can be a bit below zero, so 
So it's very much sort of building yeah. automation and, and monitoring environment. I for the, for the I do also the plan, so I get email when yeah. I need it. Yeah. If okay. Again, very much a prop type and not a large scale. For the large scale stuff with smart cities, I don't actually know these great use cases. I know the smart Santander, they're doing a lot of awesome stuff and there's yeah. these things going on, but I don't, I can't give you an awesome use case I've seen. But if, but if you want to use MQT now, you Could can you please speak to the speaker, he will yeah. repeat your question. Thank you. Uh, you can go to the public MQT server of the makerspace yeah. and then you can see temperatures of CPUs from Raspberry Pi. Okay. Uh, just a simple example, you can trust them. By the way, another use case which is not very exciting but has a large impact mm -hmm. is uh, with smart home and smart building in general and IoT uh, having uh, better energy efficiency, so reducing energy consumption in big buildings mm -hmm. with the use of sensors and, and IoT. Yeah. You look eager. Well, a very concrete exam example. We see in here the electric cars, quite a lot of them. If 10 electric cars come home at 6 o'clock and plug them in at the same time, if they don't talk, your transformer will burn. If 56 k watts in each car, that's sucking the up. So that's a really interesting use case for smart cars, where um, you need to keep them constantly charged, they need to be maintained. We're going to cut the sessions short now. Tom, thank you very much. Yeah, no problem. Uh, let me give you you should all look at these slides. Go on iotmethodology.com and you can the present. Thank you very much. That's my book. Thank you very much, everyone. Yes. Give a hand of applause to Tom for, for being Stefan. Yes.